Welcome back to Real Takes, where we are all movie love all the time with no spoilers and no plot recaps. I'm Ann Stott, and we are continuing our celebration of films based on the astrological calendar, but we have also crossed into February, which in the United States is Black History Month. So I am combining uh, our celebration of Aquarian films and filmmakers with uh, the focus of Black History Month, and I'm really excited tonight to be talking about Residue, the uh, film debut of Marawi Jarima. Now, I don't know Marawi Jarima's birthday. I couldn't find it online. I don't know the birthdays of the actors in the film. Um, and I made a decision, I'm not going to do this very much, that Residue is an Aquarian film. How do you characterize an Aquarian film, you might ask? Well, if you look up Aquarians and you start pulling adjectives, you get words like progressive, humanitarian, original, independent, exceptional, cause-oriented, and residue is all of those things. So I'm calling it an Aquarian film and talking about it. I've been wanting to talk about it for months, so I'm really, really excited. Uh, I got turned on to this film through the Independent Spirit Awards last year, and I was just, just blown away when I saw it. It's, it's a film with such a strong cinematic point of view with such an important message, and I was at the time, I was like, wow, a, a debut film with with such a such a strong sense of itself. That's interesting. Well, come to find out in researching for this episode that Marawi Jarima is the son of two independent black filmmakers. He would say fiercely independent black filmmakers. So Marawi Jarima is the son of Haile, Haile Jarima and Shirikiana Aina. And they've been making films for 40 years. Haile Jarima directed Sankofa and Bushmama, among many others. And Shurikiana Aina produced some of her husband's films. And then she's also made documentaries, most recently Footprints of Pan-Africanism. Now, I want to just stay accountable here and say that it would be really easy for me to share all this information as if I knew it already, but I didn't know it. And I'm ashamed of myself as an actor and an artist and a film lover and someone who cares about and works for social justice in this country that I didn't know about this work. And I'm also angry at the way art is controlled and disseminated in this country so that work like this is harder to find and know about. So... I'm staying accountable about that and looking forward to um, getting into Haile Jarima's filmography, Shirakiana Aina's filmography, but tonight we're talking about Residue, which as I said, I learned about through the Indie Spirit Awards last year. Uh, Residue won the John Cassavetes Award, which is the award for a film made for under $500,000. And it also won best editing over films that were made for a lot more than $500,000, which makes sense because the film employs a lot of um, sophisticated and beautiful cinematic techniques to bring a mood and a feeling to the screen. So. The film is set in northeastern Washington, D.C., specifically Q Street, where Marawi Jarima grew up. And it's a film about gentrification and in particular the way, the racist way that gentrification operates in our country. And Marawi Jarima, growing up with filmmakers, you know, tried to rebel against filmmaking. Apparently he went through five different majors while he was in college, but he came back around to filmmaking. And when he first started writing this script, he didn't want it to be autobiogra autobiographical. And he says that, you know, when he first started writing it, um, it was kind of an angry anti-gentrification script. And it wasn't until he incorporated his own personal experience of 
um, trying to find a friend from his childhood who had kind of gone missing, um, that the script kind of really rooted itself in human experience. And he just, he went from resisting it being autobiographical to embracing the fact that it was autobiographical. So in the movie, we follow Jay, who's a film student coming back from California to Washington, D.C. Jay is played by Obina Nwachukwu. And um, he comes back to his neighborhood with the intent of making a film about gentrification, very autobiographical. And it's about kind of what he comes up against while he's there. And, and as, uh, as Jerima has said in interviews, kind of the distance that had developed between his own life and the life of the people he was friends with when he was growing up. And they started shooting uh, in the summer, I think, of 2018, I think. And um, they started shooting with a first draft script, which is really unusual in film. But Jerima felt a lot of um, urgency about making this movie because he said his neighborhood was disappearing so fast that if he waited, he wouldn't have anywhere to shoot. And they started shooting with this first draft script on a very small budget, about $100,000. And he says that that gave them a lot of creative freedom to respond to what was happening around them, to use the mistakes, to use their limitations to their creative advantage. He has said that the film is imperfect. He has said it's amateur, which I don't know how I feel about that, but he said it's instinctual and he's come to embrace all of those things. And he thinks, he says that his favorite parts of the film are the things that are imperfect and the mistakes that they made into something interesting. He said in another interview, we were able to author something interesting on the fly. And I thought a lot about when you encounter young work in any medium from an artist or um, new work from an artist that's clearly rough around the edges or, you know, um, has mistakes in it or however you want to say it, but it also, the power of it overcomes those, those issues or shines through those issues. And I think Dream has really touched on it here, which is he embraced all of that. And so, and so you're very aware that you're watching a film that wasn't made for a lot of money. And you're very aware that you're watching a film that has a lot of people in it who aren't actors. And yet the vision of it and the commitment to the story they were telling and the embrace of the circumstances they were in still comes together to make a whole that's definitely greater than the sum of its parts. So they shot one summer um, with this first draft script. And then when Jerima was uh, editing that, he realized that the end wasn't right and he needed to rewrite the end. And then they went back the next summer and they shot more and they shot a new end. And so the film was actually shot in sort of two separate summers. And I'm really moved to hear that. I'm so curious what the end originally was because the end of the film is so smart and damning and a, 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 a searing takedown of the casual ease with which white people come into spaces that weren't theirs and take them over and uh, with no regard for the history they've destroyed and are replacing. Just, yeah, the end is really powerful. But even before the end, um, the film's been described as being magical realism and Dream has rejected that um, classification. He, he, for him, he refers to it as realism. He says it's how he really feels walking around his neighborhood, watching it disappear. Um, there are childhood memories in the film, but they're not done in a sort of Hollywood flashback kind of way. They're really 
um, incorporated in and edited into the film in the way we experience memory, a flash here, a moment there, the way they slice in and out of the present day story feels deeply organic, like a sort of um, felt time. I think I talked about um, when I was covering Mike Mills's film, 20th Century Women, he was talking about like emotional time versus linear time. And I feel like you really get that here, like the emotional experience of memory and place versus like a linear representational experience of place. So there's also a moment toward the end of the film where Jay, the main character, is um, has visited someone he uh, had, hadn't seen in a long time. And it's just heartbreakingly beautiful the way it's represented, how connection can transport us out of where we are into another time and space, into another felt reality kind of against all odds. So there's just really sophisticated filmmaking happening in this kind of down and dirty experience. Experience. Hey, I just wanted to jump back in because I realized while I was editing this that I hadn't looked up who edited Residue. I'd been so focused on some other issues and um, Turns out Marawi Jarima also edited the film. So he wrote it, he uh, directed it, and he edited it, which is just a huge debut achievement. And um, especially with this film, there are some moments where we kind of leap in time and space in very particular ways that um, could are hard to pull off in cinema. And I took all those leaps with the film seamlessly and uh and yeah so really moved and wanted to make sure that you all knew that he also edited the film this film came out in 2020 and you know in may of 2020 george floyd was murdered which led to this next uprising um and sort of racial reckoning in the united states and so people were like oh you know you're how amazing that you did this film about racism and gentrification, you know, this year. And he says, actually, he feels the film is late. He wanted the film to be, you know, a galvanizing force um, against gentrification and about racism. And, you know, obviously, um, we were already in a galvanized moment around those issues. But he has said that he, you know, hopes that the film is used as a weapon in the fight against gentrification and um, and racism. Another interesting note about the film, um, Ava DuVernay's production company picked up the film and distributed the film after it appeared at um, some film festivals. And Ava DuVernay has said that she considers her work to be you know, building on the foundation of Marawi Jarima's parents, Haile Jarima and uh, Shiri Kiana Aina. And so there's this beautiful full circle happening here where, you know, we never know when we're making work of any kind, who it's going to influence, when it, that influence is going to come back around, what legacy we're building. And so, you know, um, the Ava DuVernay has been so moved by Marawi Jarima's parents' work and now is in a position because of her own brave trailblazing work to help distribute his film, Residue. It's just a lovely coming full circle. And then one last story about the film. So I saw Marawi Jarima on a panel of film directors who had all made their films for under $500,000, which was a fantastic panel. And um, the moderator asked them, the last question the moderator asked them was, what was your big spend? What was the one thing you blew a lot of money on that was like a fight or, you know, seemed crazy, but you knew you needed to spend money on it? And it was fascinating because each director had a different answer. One person knew that sound and the sound design was gonna be really important in his film. He spent half of his budget on sound. 
another director said there was one location that they needed for like a third of the film and and um she knew that it had to be organic and authentic and if it were wrong the film wouldn't work and they spent like ten thousand dollars a day on this location and Marawi Jarima said that his big spend was on food because really he was just asking his community to be a part of this film and many of the people in the film are people he grew up with who are playing some version of themselves or you know someone they knew and most of them didn't make any money and he was like if i'm gonna ask these people to come out for this movie like this and not get paid i am at least gonna feed them really well and i i loved that answer and that story but i love this film i love this film i'm very excited to see what marawi jarima does next I hope you watch this movie. If you've seen it, please comment below. Let me know what you think. If you haven't seen it, please go watch it. And I will see you next Wednesday. Thanks for watching Real Takes. Hit the subscribe button below so the algorithms will tell you when new episodes are out. And if you want to support Real Takes, please visit my Patreon page where you can join at any tier from $2 to $100 per thing I make. The $15 tier is specifically about supporting real takes and you'll get behind the scenes information and be thanked in future videos. See you next Wednesday.